some time ago, just as God has called me to the prophetic ministry. Um, it's not easy because God said to turn your face like flint and not worry about what the people say or what the people do or how they look. That's why you have to turn your face like flint. Many things God has given me over the years, way back on Blossom Street, they just now come into pass. One thing that the word of God has given me um, and the prophetic call that he has called me into is that of a seer. So every time that God gives me a word, it doesn't happen just right then. And so because it doesn't go come to pass right then, people get lax and they fail to follow the instructions of the Lord. But God said, for sure, you watch, you see, it will come to pass. And so the things God has spoken over 30 or 40 years ago, he has brought to pass. And today God has given me another word for the church. And the title of the word, the message is back to the water. Back to the water. And so as I get into the word, I want us to just listen to what God has to say. Take what's for you, what's not for you. Uh, ponder it in your heart. And you will understand it better by and by because it will come and you will need it when God says you need it. But in this word, uh, back to the water, it all came about when I had a dream a few months ago. And in this dream, my husband and I were like on a beach and the ocean was there in front of us. And so as we walked the beach and we went up on the pier, uh, we looked, and my husband took me by the hand and he said, let's go for a walk. So I said, okay. So he took me by the hand, and I know in this dream he represents the spirit of the Lord. But he took me by the hand and we began to walk down to the seashore. And... We started walking, but the strangest thing was we started walking on the water. So we walked out on the water, and we began to look around. And I looked down, and it was like a sea of glass. And as I looked down and I saw, I could see everything under the water. I could see the sea life. I could see the fish and, and everything that was swimming around underneath. And so we walked, and then he said to me, okay, let's go back now. So as we started walking back towards the shore, I noticed all of a sudden the water started to dissipate. It started fading and going away. And the more we walked back to shore, the more the water went away. And so I said, well, let's hurry back because... It's going to be mud, and it's all this fish and sea life here. Let's get back. So we got back to the, to the shore. And as we walked on the shore, all the water turned around and looked, and all this water was gone. And there was nothing left but just sea life. The fish were panting and, and gasping for breath, and all the sea life was dying under the water, that was, uh, the water was there. And they were gasping, and they couldn't get their breath. And it was all because they were out of their environment. Their environment, the water was gone because of all the circumstances that had come to pass. And God has showed me an interpretation of this dream in about two to three days, and he began to show me the interpretation of the dream that in scripture, the water represents the spirit and the anointing of God, and it represents the word of God. But he was showing me how that the condition of the people were like the sea life. 
the condition of God's people, their people are gasping for life. So many things have been happening, one thing right after another. Something has always been happening, and people of God are getting uh, hurt, and they're fearful because of the things that are coming up on the earth. And so there's so many things that are happening in our lives that we're questioning God, and we don't understand what's going on. So he showed me the interpretation that the fish represent the people of God. Because many things, scriptures refer to the fact that the people of God and people are referred to as fish. But as the water began to dissipate, as Bishop and I walked off the scene, that was the state of the people that were left behind. Because God wants you to know you can't live off of my water. You can't live off the Bishop's water. You can't live off of anybody else's water. You have to have your own water, which is your own relationship with God. So God said to me, he said, let me explain to you what is going on by using the scenario of the children of Israel in the book of first of Habakkuk, the first chapter, the 12th through the 17th verse. And in this scripture about Habakkuk, the children of Israel were in bondage. They were held captive. So the Israelites were held captive to the Assyrians, and Judah was held captive by the Chaldeans. And the Bible said that their captors were terrible, they were vicious, and they were dreadful. And God said to tell you that the, what you're feeling in your life, the things that are going on, is our adversary, the devil. And the things that he is putting in our, our lives and bringing upon us, we feel like it is terrible, it's vicious, and it's dreadful. A terrible attack that the enemy has unleashed on the people of God. And so in Habakkuk, the tw uh, first chapter, 12 through 17, it reads, Out thou not everlasting, O Lord my God, because his people, they didn't understand what was happening to them. So they began to question God, and this is what they said. Out thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one, we should not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore thou lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and beholdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he, and makest men as fish of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their nets and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. And the 17th verse says, Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? So the people of God were uh, concerned because of all that was coming up on them. And they couldn't understand why, God, why do you let this happen to us? Lord, we pray and we pray and it seems like you're not listening. It seems like you just can't hear us. So the people were all concerned because they were saying, how long shall I cry and thou not hear me, O oh God? How long will I cry and, about the violence and thou shall not save me? Why is it that your judgment never goes forth because of my enemy? How long will you let him do this to me? And this is what the people of God are crying out, even though some of us don't say it verbally, it's in our mind. And we're wondering, what, God, what, what in the world is going on? What's happening to us, God? We just don't know. 
But God is saying that the enemy has caught us in his net because the water, the water is gone out of our lives. And the word says that we're like broken cisterns, that's vessels that has a crack in it. And that we don't recognize it right away because the crack is so thin. But the water is slowly, slowly seeping, seeping out, seeping out, and draining the people of God of the victory that God has ordained for us to have. So the devil has just caught us out in the open because we're out of the environment that we should be in. And the, the, the water is dried up in our lives. And because the water is dried up, the enemy can just come in and scoop us up in his net and hold us captive. And that's exactly what he has done. Because we have allowed the water to seep out of our lives. Now the word tells us that in the scripture, water represents a couple of things. The water represents the life and the word. And it represents the Holy Spirit, and it represents the anointing. Now, we know that the word is who? Jesus. In St. John, the first chapter and the first verse, it says that Jesus in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All right? And then later on, around the 14th, it says, and the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. But we know that the word is Jesus. Is that right? Now, Jesus came into the earth, and he was born as a child, just like all of us. So Jesus was the word, and he was born in the flesh. But as Jesus began to grow, he had to go through everything that we go through. Okay, and as he began to grow as the word, he was the word standing alone by himself. He had to go through and he had to receive the Holy Ghost, just like we do. Without the Holy Ghost, Jesus, the word, stands alone. We need the Holy Spirit to ignite the word of God the word says to quicken, to make alive. So we can have Jesus, but if we don't accept the fullness of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then we're just words on a page. We need the Holy Spirit to ignite the word of God in our lives. Because the word says that in his scripture, he says that he, he gives us everything that we need. And God says that the word of God in us, in us, in us, we need it in us. All right? And he says that the Holy Spirit is the action word. The Holy Spirit is the accent. Without him, we're nothing. And I just want to have a little sidebar about Jesus and about his life. As Bishop would always say, I want to have a sidebar. Something for our young people, for our children. Jesus was a child just like we were. He had to grow up just like us. Now, there was a section in the Bible, and it talks about how when Jesus and his parents were going to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover, that um, on when they were on their way back, now they had went all the way to the city, and then a day, a day trip back, they had already left going back home, but then they turn around and they see Jesus is gone. Where is he? They were looking all over for Jesus. Where is Jesus? We can't find him. They asked everybody. They had to go a day's journey all the way back to Jerusalem, to get Jesus because they didn't know who he was. And at the time, he was only 12 years old, little young people. He was only 12. So here his parents looking for him. Now, the Bible doesn't tell it all detail by detail, but we can read between the lines. His parents were upset. 
because he went and he didn't tell them where he was going. And so when Jesus, when the parents got back to Jerusalem, they asked and inquired if anybody had seen them, and there he was in the temple. But he was talking to the scribes and the rulers and the teachers, and he was debating with them and talking with them. And when the parents came on and they said, Jesus, why didn't you tell us where you were going? And Jesus, as we would say it today, he made a sarcastic remark. He said, uh, I had to get about my father's business. And so when you really talk about it and you look between the lines, his parents were upset with him. Even though it was Jesus, they were upset with him because he was only 12 years old. But... In the, in, the Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew culture, all right, the young men, when they became age 12 or 13, they had what they call a bar mitzvah. And that's a rite of passage into another stage of adulthood. And for the girls at that same age, they have a rite of passage called a bar, bar, uh, bat mitzvah. All right, so they both had this rite of passage. So just because Jesus was age 12 didn't mean that he could not disobey, that he had to dis, uh, the way able to disobey his parents. He still had to go back and obey his parents. And I can, I can uh, just understand that some of us uh, parents today, at least in my day, if my child had come up to me at 12 years old and told me I have to get about my father's business, then I would have had something else to say to him, and it wouldn't have been good. And so when we read between the lines, young people, the Bible tells us to obey our parents, and, our, and even our spiritual parents. Because sometimes if the bishop tells us to do something, some of us will say, well, the Lord told me to do this. Or what the Holy Ghost told me to do that. And so it's not obeying your parents. If God has given us leaders and instruction over us, then we need to obey what God has told the leader to tell us. And so we have to be subject to somebody. We have to be subject to authorities that God has placed over us. And so these are the things that God is saying to us. So I just wanted to get a little to the side to let the young people know that it doesn't matter if you're 12 or you're 13 or you're 15 or you're 16 or like our society says, if you're 18, you can do whatever you want to do. But as long as you're in your parents' house, eating your parents' food, Amen. under their shelter, then you have to obey what your parents say. Otherwise, you're not only in trouble with them, but you're in trouble with God. And so those are the words of God. Now I'm coming back to the things that God is saying to us. I wanted to share that with the young people because this is for everybody. Everybody. So the scripture says that water represents life. In the word and the spirit of the, the Holy Spirit and the anointing is the hand of God on the life of a person so the Holy Ghost is our seal we need the Holy Spirit to be a seal and it's a seal of approval from God and we cannot live and the word of God cannot thrive in us unless we receive the Holy Spirit so when the, when the, when the scripture, when the, the dream that God gave me is saying that we need to get back to the water, it's because we can't live and we can't thrive and we can't survive without the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in St. John 3 and 5, he said, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So without the water, we cannot survive in the natural, and without the water, we cannot survive in the spiritual. Because in the natural, we can only live about 100 hours without water. 
And that's a little bit over four days. In the natural, if we don't have that water, then we can die. So we're trying to survive out in the wrong environment. No water, no spirit. No spirit, no anointing. We need the word of God, then we need the spirit of God, because it is the spirit that quickens the word and gives it life so that we can be partakers of the divine nature of God. So it's like this. When I was in first grade, and I can remember that far back. I was in first grade, and when I went to school, they gave us these little books. And this, in this book it said, C. Dick. C. Jane. C. Spot. And then the teacher would teach us, it said, then you need the verb, which is the action word. When you give Dick and Jane and spot action, then Dick can jump. Then see Jane skip. And then see spot leap. So when they got the action word, they'd be able to move. And so it is with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the action word. Without the Holy Spirit, the words are just words. Without the Holy Spirit, without us accepting the fullness of the Godhead, then we just have Jesus in one state. But when we accept the fullness, then we can move. Then we can live. Then we can have our being. Because that's what the scripture says in Acts, Acts 17, 28. It says, for in him we live. In him we move. And in him we have our being. So when we receive the Holy Ghost, now you can move. Now you can live. Now you can have your being because of the Holy Ghost. But without it, we stand still. Without the Holy Ghost, without the water. So many of us are thriving, trying to thrive out of the water. We need the water. We need the anointing of God because it's the anointing of God that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing of God that will set us free. We need it. We can't live without it. So I'm here to, to bring life and health to the people of God. To let you know that whatever you're going through. To let you know that God said he had not forsaken you. He has not forgotten you. And that he knows what you're going through. But some of us are going through because of what we brought upon ourselves. And some of us are going through for the glory of God. Because God wants to show two things. He wants to show us his awesome power. And then he wants to show us, he wants to show the, what the, the devil, that he is God. The devil is bragging right now because some of us are against the rope. He's bragging because he thinks you have you down. He's bragging because he thinks he has you against the ropes. But you, God, wants you to know that he is allowing things to happen in your life so that he can show his might and his power. Yes. Hallelujah. That's why so many things are happening one right after another. But we have to be like Job. And he said, all the days of my appointed time, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until my change comes. Hallelujah. That's what we have to do. Wherever God has you right now, wherever he has you, even if you brought it upon yourself, if you repent and ask God to forgive you, whatever it is, God says that he has it all under control. He has it all under control. He wants you to know that it is important the stance that you take from the time you have the problem 
in between till the time you're delivered. It's important how you act and how you respond. Because only the just is going to live by faith. It's going to take faith for it to, us to get through where we're going. He told me to just tell you this little story about my own life. What happened when I was sick. This is just one of the stages of the sickness that I had. Could I have some water, please? Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that happened to me when I had this sickness called sarcoidosis, it just went through my body. It started attacking all my organs. And so this disease had enlarged my spleen. And it was so large that I looked like I was four months pregnant. My navel had popped out just like a pregnant woman. And so then I had lost 30 pounds within two weeks. The doctor said, well, I'm going to call the surgeon and see what we can do because we might have to take, remove your spleen. And if I remove your spleen, you're going to have to be on medication for the rest of your life. So I said in my mind, I'm not having surgery and I'm not going to be on medication the rest of my life. And so when I was in the examination room and the doctor told me this, and he said, I'm going to call for the surgeon upstairs and have him coming down to take a look at you. So he came, the surgeon came down and he opened the door and he looked at me and he said to the doctor, I'm not touching her. And so... The doctor said, well, why, why, why? So they went out of the room and they started talking. And so my doctor came back and he said, well, the surgeon says, he's not going to touch you. There's nothing we can do. I said to him, I said, okay, so I just have to live like this? And he said, well, at least you're alive. And that's all, that's all the encouragement that he gave me. So... I left there, and something told me to go by my parents' house. So I went by my parents' house, and as I went there, they were doing their usual thing. They, one was sitting at this side of the table, one sitting at there. They were reading their Bibles. And so I came in the door. It was raining that day, so I had on a raincoat. And I said hi, and, and then my father said, I just had a dream about you. And I said, really? I said, what was it about? He said, I dreamed that you were pregnant. He said, but then in the dream, I looked at you, and I said, she ain't pregnant. She's sick. And I said, well, the dream is true. And so I took my coat off, and I showed him. And he said, hmm, you know, my, well, anybody that knew my father, he, <laughs> he came and he touched my stomach, and he said, hmm. He said, well, in the dream, he said, I prayed for you, and your stomach went back to normal. And so I got excited, and I was all excited because of the word. All right? I was excited because of the word. But then he said to me, he said, I'm going to come over every Monday. Me and your mother are coming over every Monday, and we're going to anoint you, and we're going to pray. I said, okay, and I was excited because I got the word. But what happened was he came over on that Monday, and my father, like any, if anybody knows him, he don't just anoint you like that. He told me, I want you to wear some old clothes because we're going to anoint you. So when I came, when he came over, he with my mother, he said to my mother, take her in the bathroom, Take her top off and douse her down real good. So he doused me. She doused me down real good with the anointing oil. Put my top back on. We went out into the living room and I laid on the sofa and he said, now you lay here and we're going to pray. They got on their knees and they prayed. And they prayed and it wasn't a just a slap and a pray. They prayed and then they got up. And then the next day he called me. He said, anything happened? I said, 
No. And then the next week, the same procedure. The next day, anything happen? I said, no. Third week, same procedure. Same question after the next day. Did anything happen? I said, no. And then between that time, the enemy tried to get me discouraged, tried to make me say, well, God's not going to do anything. And I'm telling you how the enemy's working in your life. And he before between your victory, that's what he's trying to do. On the fourth week, same thing, same procedure, same thing happened the next day. He said, anything happened? I said, I, I can't tell. I don't know. I can't tell. I just can't tell. I think something's happening, but I don't know. And so he said, okay, I'll be back the next week. On the fifth week, the same thing, same procedure. The next day, he, he asked me again. I said, I'm not sure, but I felt like Elijah when he told his servant to go and look for rain. And every time he told him to go look for rain, there was nothing. He couldn't see any signs. Hallelujah. But one day, one day he came back with a report. And in the report, he said, I see a, a, a cloud like the size of a man's hand. And let him know that God, the very time God said the word, that's when something started happening. On about the fifth week, he came over again, the same procedure, and God will give us signs. I didn't know it, but the enlargement of my stomach and the navel coming out was the sign. And I, I was like, I was like the old folks, and you all probably don't know this, when the babies back then had hernias, they would put a, a quarter or a silver dollar on there and tape it down trying to hope that it would go back in. That's what I did. I said, I look a mess. I stood in the mirror. I said, God, look at me. I'm a mess. I'm skin and bones, and my stomach is hot like this. I couldn't wear any clothes. Had to wear maternity clothes. And I said, God, look at me. But on the fifth week, on the fifth week, the sign that God purposed, oh, I woke up the next day, and I looked the navel had gone back in. And I said, God, something's happening. He asked me, what, did something happen? I said, yes, 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 daddy, something's happening. And the navel had gone back in. I could feel the lump on this side. And he said, I'm coming back again. The next week he came back again, the same procedure. On the next day, I woke up and I could feel it move over to this side. And the next week, over to that side. And after that, week after week, it went down all the way back to normal. Something that the enemy said would not happen. God said will happen. If you learn how to wait, to wait, to wait, to wait, to wait. Hallelujah. If you learn how to wait on God. If you trust him, if you believe him, things will happen. He let me know that it happened the very time he said the word. The very time he gave the word, it had already happened. He just wanted to see what I was going to do. He wanted to see if I had faith. He wanted to see if I was going to trust him. That's what God wants to see with you. He wants to see if you're going to trust him. He wants to see if you're going to have faith. He wants to see what you're going to do. He wants you to know, hallelujah. He wants to see if you're going to stand there and say all the days of my appointed time. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until my change comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He wants to see what you're going to do. Hallelujah. Because the enemy wants you to think that God is not what he says he is. He wants you to think that God has no power. Thank you. Mm. He wants to make you think that he is greater than God. But he's a liar. Thank you, 
Lord Jesus. I found out he's a liar. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And as that disease continued to rip through my body, hallelujah, God let me know that sometimes there's some casualties. In any warfare, there's some casualties. So we need to be able to say, I don't care what happens. All I know, if he don't deliver me the way I want him to deliver me, it's still okay. All God wants us to know is that we have to be in a place to say, God, if it doesn't happen, I know that you're still able. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We want God to deliver us the way we want to be delivered. But can we stand still and say, God, if it doesn't happen the way I want it to happen, do I still trust you? Do I still believe you? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. That's why God gave me a song. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because the disease moved on to my eyes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I end up blind in one eye. Hallelujah. Y'all don't even know it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But I wrote a song that day. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Guess what? Satan, I'm telling you right now, if I never see again, hallelujah, it's too late, hallelujah, because I've seen enough to know that Jesus loves me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I've seen enough to know that he cares for me. Hallelujah. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what you do. It's too late. God already proved himself to me. God already showed himself to me. I know what God can do. I know what God can do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And my life belongs to him. Thank you, Lord. My life belongs to him. So I said the day that I told God he could come into my life, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, it's okay, God. Whatever, Lord, however you want to use me, use me. Because we don't realize if, if no one's ever sick, how do we know he's a healer? We are the people of God. God has a right to do whatever he wants with you. Whatever he wants with you, he's able to do whatever he wants. We have to say, say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever you want to do with me, Lord. I know it's for your glory. Hallelujah. It's for your glory. So do what you want with me, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We come to God with, with conditions. But there's no conditions in God. Oh, we just have to say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So how do we survive? Get back to the water. That's how you're going to survive. Get back to the water. The water of the word ignited by the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Because in 2 Peter, first chapter and the third verse, it says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to the glory and virtue. God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He's given us everything that we need pertaining to life. That's what he said. Everything we need, he's given it to us. 
and everything that we need pertaining to godliness, he's given it to us. God has given it to us. So how can we tell we need water? We get thirsty. Thirst is a natural occurrence in the body because it's a signal that your body needs something. And what happened is we substitute. It happened in my life. I, my body needed water and I kept giving it Pepsi Cola. I kept substituting. I said, when I, my body said, I'm thirsty, I'd grab me a Pepsi. It would last for a little while. Before you know it, I was thirsty again. And at all that time, my body was suffering because I was substituting. And God said, that's what we're doing in the spiritual realm. When our body, our spiritual body, our spiritual man says, I'm thirsty, we give it a substitute. And we think we're okay. And then we're back here again because we're thirsty again. And we keep getting a substitute. And God said, it's time for us to get the real thing. Because our body is suffering. Our body is suffering. And we're sick and don't know why. It's because we better get back to the water. How do we know that we need water? It's because nothing else satisfies. Nothing else satisfies. Nothing will satisfy us. How do we know we need water? When we stop growing, we know we need water. When the wrong type of plants spring up, we know we need water. When we see strange behavior starting to come back again, we know we need water. When we see old things trying to come back, we know we need water. When things don't line up with the word of God in our lives and we accept it, you know you need water. We need to get back to the water. And I want to say, young people, young adults, I know, and like I said, I have to say what God tells me to say. But we have compromised with God. All of us have compromised in some way or form. But God said we have compromised because he said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That wasn't just for the Old Testament. But this God's day. God has a day. And I'm not talking about some people have to, have to you know, health care workers. That's for a good cause. But God is saying the majority of us, we have compromised the things of God and we have put things on God's day. And because we know that it's not a sin sin as what we call sin, so we say it's okay and we make excuses for it. But we're compromising. Each time we compromise, we're losing some water. We're losing water each time that we compromise. And God is saying to tell you that you need to do it. Stop now. Minister Raymond Renee ministered words a long time ago. And she said, just do it. That stuck with me. Just do it. You know how we procrastinate. We make excuses all the time about what we should do. And then she just said, just do it. And I took that to my own life. And my mind always tell me different things. And when I know God says do something, my mind tell me something else. And then I remember, just do it. Stop it. And when I, my kids were small, I would tell them that. Did I tell you what to do? Just do it. Don't talk back. Just do it. And God is saying the same thing. Our children's lives depend on it. We need to show them priorities. If we don't show them priorities now, later on, 
it's going to be a problem. They're going to have a hard time because we didn't, we didn't put God first. We didn't teach them to put God first. And just because it may have worked for you don't mean it worked for somebody else. So when we tell somebody else to follow us doing what we're doing, then you might be okay. But the other person is weaker than you, and they can't handle it. And so they're losing water. The devil is raising havoc in our families, raising havoc in marriages with our children, and it's all because we're losing water. We're losing water. So God is saying, get back to the water. Don't compromise. Don't question it. Just do it. Do it. Tell your children, we're going to do it. And I know in my own children's lives, I know they need sports. Lord knows I know they need sports. My son John was so hyper. When he was a little boy, just to get rest, I had to lock him in my arms like that and lay down with him. Until he, and make him go to sleep. He was so active. When he went to first grade, second grade, they wanted to put him on Ritalin. I said, I don't believe in that. He just has too much energy, that's all. I put him in every sport I could get him in. But never compromised God. And he's the opposite now. He's the opposite now. But God blessed because we didn't compromise. He still got a scholarship. He still went to school four years, college four years without paying anything. We didn't compromise, but he still did it. God still did it. We need to stand on the word of God, get back to the water. Get back to the water. So in conclusion, I stand on my watch. I stand on my watch, like Habakkuk said in the second chapter, verse 1 through 4. I said the same thing. I said, God, I see all this stuff happening to your people. I've been praying and praying. And I want you to help your people. I want you to show them who you are. Show them how awesome you are. And I said like Habakkuk, I'm going to get up on my watch. I'm going to set me on the tower. And I'm going to watch and see what you have to say about what's going on with your people. Because I want to know, this is my complaint, Lord. I want to see. And then the Lord said to me, Ruth, write the vision. Write the vision. Write it down and make it plain. Make it plain so that they that read it will run with it. They will catch it and they will run with it. And when they run with it, they will be healed. But they need to know that the vision in many of our cases is going to take, is going to be for a while. He said, but one thing, I spoke it and I do not lie and the vision will not lie. And though it tarries people of God, Still wait on it. Wait on it. Don't give up. Wait on it. He said it will surely come. It will not tarry. He said, behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright. Meaning some of us aren't going to take it in. He said, but the just will live by his faith. Not by Bishop's faith. Not by my faith. Not by your parents' faith, but you're going to live by your faith. You will live by your faith. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. 
to see what God is going to do. I remember when I came back to the Lord, I was fed up. I couldn't take no more. I was just a young woman, young bride, married early, had kids early. On my third child and my husband and I weren't getting along, I said, that's it. I'm going to get rid of this third child and I'm going to take my two boys and I'm out of here. That's what I said. And so I went in the kitchen that night trying to abort, trying to abort my child. Because I had made up in my mind what I was going to do. And so I was in that kitchen. And when the pain started to come, I got scared. And that's what the enemy will do. Is he'll put fear in you. But I got fearful. And then he stood there in the kitchen and laughed at me. I, the devil. I'm talking about the devil. And he said to me, you are going to have a girl and you're never going to forgive yourself. You're going to hate yourself for the rest of your life. And when he said that, I ran to my bedroom and I fell on my face and I said, Lord Jesus, help me. And now I said that all I could do was cry. I cried and I cried and I cried till I was empty. Then I got up on my knees and I went to the phone and I called my father. I said, Daddy, do you still have church on Friday night? He said, yes. I said, can you come and pick me up? He said, I'll be right there. He came and he picked me up. And I said, come upstairs and help me with the kids. He did that and we came down and he went to church in that little storefront. And I went to church and he was giving his message. And I was sitting there squirming in my seat. I said, oh God, let me hurry up and finish speaking. I didn't, understand. I didn't hear anything he said. All I knew was what I wanted. All I knew is what I needed. And when he finally said, and in conclusion, and that's what he would always say at the end of his messages. Now, in conclusion, is there anybody that need anything from the Lord? I jumped out of my seat because it didn't happen when I got to the building. It happened before I got to the building. And when he said, in conclusion, is there anybody that needs anything from the Lord? I jumped from my seat and I went straight to the front. And he said to me, daughter, what is it you want from the Lord? And the Holy Ghost was already in me. All I had to do was open my mouth. But when he said that, I said, I want the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of the Lord came out of me like a fountain of water. It was a gusher. I had a gusher right away. The Spirit of the Lord came up out of me. Some, a light hit me in the forehead, knocked me off my feet. And when I got up, I was not the same. Hallelujah. I didn't think the way I used to think. I didn't act the way I used to act. I didn't look the way I used to look. When I got home, I didn't treat my husband like I used to treat him. I didn't act like I used to. God showed me a man, hallelujah, that needed help just like I did, hallelujah. And he helped me to pray for my husband in another way. Before I prayed because of what was happening to me, I prayed, Lord, fix my husband for me. Everything was selfish. Everything was for me. But when I got the Holy Ghost, my prayer changed. And I said, God, this is just a man that needs help just like I did. Hallelujah. And from that day to this, hallelujah, I said to my husband that day, when he was talking about all that he was going through, I said, have you tried Jesus? Why don't, you, why don't you give him a try? And my husband gave him a try. He gave him a try. And he came to the Lord. And from that day to this, 
we have walked with the Lord all the days of our lives. From that point on, we walk with the Lord. Because we meant business with him. We meant business with the Lord. We tried it our way and it didn't work. We did things our way and it didn't help us. We would sit in the bed and we'd read the word. He would read a chapter, then I'd read a chapter. He would read to me, I would read to him. He would read to me, I would read to him. And then he would say, okay, one more chapter, we're going to go to bed. Okay, we read one more chapter, and it got too good. Okay, just one more. Okay, you read one more then. And okay, I'd read another one. And we'd read that one. And, and okay, we're going to cut the lights off after this. Okay, we read that one. Oh, let's see what happens after that. Well, we read another. We would stay up reading the Bible. Reading the word of God. Just feasting on the word. And God says today to his people, come on, back to the water. You can't survive where you are. Some of us that had the water, it seeped out. Some of us never had the water. We get our foot in. And then we take it back out. Each week we put our foot in and we take it back out. God said it's time to get in all the way. All the way. So the question I have in conclusion is, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? It's time to get back to the water back to the water.